Last year, I had this crazy idea to do a video about the themes and analysis of Dragon's Dogma. And as I did my research, I kept running across the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche. So the video ended up largely being about that. But I started seeing Nietzsche's ideas all over my games, from Final Fantasy to Blast Blue to Metal Gear Solid, and I had to wonder, why is Nietzsche so big in Japan? So I did a bit of digging, and I want to share what I've come up with so far. I'll put my main sources on screen and in the description. Let's start by looking to history. So, 1854, Commodore Perry comes around and forces Japan to open up its borders, and there's a bunch of turmoil. 1868, Meiji is declared God Emperor, and Japan starts getting all nationalistic and militaristic to try to prove it can remain with the big boys. They unban Christianity in 1873. The Christians are never a large group, but they get Japan thinking more about cultivating their inner life. Japan starts learning, too. They send students out all over the world who start bringing back all sorts of ideas. By 1900, Kant, Hegel, and Schopenhauer are like the main guys being taught in philosophy classes in Japan. So basically, all the pieces are being set up for Nietzsche to knock down. So then there's this guy, Chogyu Takayama. Chogyu was a literary critic and a nationalist, and he was pretty popular with the young men in Japan. In January of 1901, he releases an article called The Literature as Culture Critic, in which he criticizes a lot of Japanese culture, takes a distinctly individualist turn, and says his eyes were opened by a few of Nietzsche's writings. Then, in August of 1901, he releases a real bombshell of an article called On the Aesthetic Life, which criticizes the moral life promoted by the Christians and the cognitive life promoted by the philosophers and instead promotes an aesthetic life. This is all pretty Nietzschean so far. But then he goes on to say that the purest aesthetic value is the satisfaction of the instincts and that the utmost happiness in life is the satisfaction of sexual desire, which seem to be entirely his own thoughts. In fact, when others are quick to point out, hey, uh, this article seems pretty Nietzschean. He denies it completely, saying that while he was inspired by Nietzsche, the man, he came up with all of these ideas himself. Either way, this article starts a two-year debate on the aesthetic life, which brings Nietzsche into public awareness in Japan. Fast forward a bit, and in 1911, Thus Spake Zarathustra becomes the first of Nietzsche's works to be fully translated into Japanese. Then, in 1913, Watsuji Tetsuro releases his 600-page Nietzsche study, which combines ideas from Nietzsche with ideas from Japanese philosophy of the time, including ideas from Zen Buddhism. But here's where I think the really important historical thing happens, and that's that in the time leading up to and during World War II, Nietzsche is hardly discussed in Japan at all. The growing nationalism and militarism just doesn't have room for him. I suspect part of this might be that the God Emperor doesn't like this guy saying God is dead, but I can't find a source on that, so I can't say for sure. So in Germany, during the World Wars, the Germans are going Ubermensch this and will to power that, and it really leaves a bad taste in the mouths of everyone in the West. So after World War II ends, there's a sort of taboo on Nietzsche for a while. Then Heidegger starts using Nietzsche to argue that because technology is a manifestation of will to power, no one person can be held responsible for the mass murder during the wars because the existence of the technology that allows for mass murder causes the mass murder to be faded. To my mind, this is just a really bad argument for a number of reasons, but I'm likely misconstruing and misunderstanding his argument anyway, so refuting it here would just be straw manning. Anyways, in Japan, a former student of Taidegger named Nishitani Keiji writes a couple of books that pretty explicitly combine Nietzschean thought with Zen Buddhism. The first is called The Self-Overcoming of Nihilism, and the second is called Religion and Nothingness. Both have English translations, but I haven't had time to read them yet. But Nishitani argues in a similar vein as Heidegger that, and again, I may be misunderstanding this, Technology is a form of will to power, and that Japan should become the next technological giant. Further, now that Japan no longer has a special claim of a god as emperor, 
in order to stave off a cultural nihilism threatened by assimilation, it needs to maintain its identity by returning to its traditional culture. So he used Nietzsche to prescribe a simultaneous embrace of the technology of the future and the cultural traditions of the past, which you may have noticed is what Japan has in fact been trying to do. If we move even further to the right, we have figures such as Nishibe Susumo, Watanabe Shuichi, and Nishio Kanji, who use Nietzsche to argue for what they call a healthy Japanese nationalism, wishing to enforce traditional Japanese values rooted in Bushido and a strict hierarchy. They argue against modern human rights in favor of noblesse oblige, the obligation of the noble, and for examples of how well that tends to work out, you can look to any dictatorship. To make it explicit, as someone on the left myself, I am totally opposed to these guys. So now we have a couple of historical arguments for why Nietzsche is so popular in Japan, namely that the taboo on him that was left over by World War II wasn't really felt in Japan, so they got a head start on post-war studies of him, and secondly, that he was tied to Japanese nationalism after the war. But that doesn't really answer the question that underlies why I'm interested in this topic. Maybe the question I really want to answer is, why is Nietzsche so appealing to me? Remember from earlier that both Watsuji and Nishitani combine elements of Nietzsche with elements of Zen Buddhism? I think this shows there's some resonance there, and I'd like to dive deeper into that for a future video, but for now I'd like to go into what I see as the biggest resonance between the two. So, Nietzsche wouldn't have been familiar with Zen Buddhism. He would have only been familiar with Hinayana Buddhism, as would Schopenhauer. In Hinayana Buddhism, the only way to escape suffering is to escape existence, and this is the point of view that Schopenhauer takes on and Nietzsche ultimately rejects. However, in Zen Buddhism, there is the possibility of finding nirvana while still existing in the material plane, and I think that Nietzsche's refutation of Schopenhauer is the key to this. One must be willing to say yes to life despite the existence of suffering, to take suffering on, in order to attain this type of enlightenment. I don't know if this matches Zen exactly, but this is my current hypothesis, and, as I said, something I'd like to explore further. Anyway, I think this compatibility between Nietzsche and Zen Buddhism in particular is another reason that Nietzsche enjoys such popularity in Japan. Which is not to say that Nietzsche is unpopular elsewhere. While there was a bit of a taboo on Nietzsche in the West immediately after World War II, that began to lift in the 60s and 70s with figures such as Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze, and I suppose I have to mention Jordan Peterson somewhere in here, and now Nietzsche has plenty of followers on both the left and the right. And this makes sense to me. Global capitalism, the god of our modern world, is a god with no promise of salvation, a god that leaves our lives empty and puts us in a nihilistic state. And Nietzsche sort of saw this coming and tried to find a way out of nihilism. So we're all looking through his work, trying to see what he saw, to find our own way out of nihilism, to figure out how we can kill this god of global capitalism, and just what to do when god is dead. Thanks for watching. Now go out, make the world a better place, as I know you will.